Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Here's worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hey there, welcome to ATL and 29, the podcast that looks at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. We have a special guest today. It's Brad Rowland. I would call it his ATL and 29 debut, but given what we've got here at ATL and 29, that's more an issue of just Brad taking pity on us. Welcome, Brad. That, that's not at all true, but I appreciate uh, you having me on. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a frequent listener, uh, so I'm excited to make my debut of sorts on, on today's podcast. I'm definitely always going to talk to you about basketball. That's kind of what we do. That is what we do. We'll be doing it tomorrow night. Uh, I don't even. Oh, it's Dallas at the uh, Hawks Mavericks game. All right, so I've got John here to do some over unders. That sound good? Absolutely. I was ready to talk some uh, some numbers. We can get we can get deep, as deep as you want into the numbers. So it's uh, always that's, that's always entertaining. All right. So just so that the the audience knows, uh, I've set up some over unders. A few of them are going to be team win totals, and that's where we'll start. Uh, but then I want to move on to just some other ones that I've made up, uh, just sort of figments of my own imagination with you know some individual player stats and things like that. So uh, if you want to fire up Basketball Reference. As a, as a reference point for where you might get some of these numbers on the individuals, uh, feel free. And uh, if if the typing comes through on the microphone, that is not a big deal. All right, so we're going to start here at home. Uh, the Atlanta Hawks, their line for the season is 27 and a half wins. Where do you peg them? Boy, I think it's actually a good number. Uh, I, I was on Nate Duncan's podcast uh I guess probably a month ago now, and I the answer I gave him was 26 wins. Uh, since then, I think I have become a little bit more optimistic. I don't know how much of that is just being browbeaten by Hawks fans, or how much of that is uh, wait preseason. But <laughs> should the Hawks sign Eddie Tavares? Yeah, they uh, should. You're right. <laughs> yeah, it's no, all, they it's don't have this, the roster spot. Sadly. They don't. They, uh, it it would be fun to have Eddie back for sure, but no, it's. I think I'm I'm definitely more optimistic now than I was then. I think in terms of the of the of the performance, it's just sort of uh, it's the delicate balance of how much they want to win and how their roster moves might be impacted in the middle of the season. You know, there is all these guys who are on tradable contracts, et cetera, et cetera. I think if you told me that they um, were to keep this roster and it was healthy all year, I would probably go over. But I, I'm gonna, I'm still gonna shade a little bit under that number, even while saying that I think it's a good number. I think 27 and a half is pretty much where you would think it would be, and you can find people that will go higher and lower on that number. But I'll, I'll say under, just because I've said that in print already, uh, and I, I don't, I want to be at least somewhat consistent. But it's, it's pretty reasonable. Okay, so you're hinting at a trade, and you don't work for Hawks.com. So, uh, who, no, it's, who, it's who, who would you say is the most likely Hawk to be traded? Yeah, it's not that I think it's necessarily going to be happening specifically. I just think there is some incentive for the Hawks to look in that direction with oh, some sure. of their veterans. You know, you know, guys like I'm not saying any. Uh, there's no. This is not inside info, but it's uh, you know, guys like Dwayne Dedman, guys like Marco Bellinelli, Ursula Vasova. Those guys are all on effectively one year contracts. You know, Dedman has a player option, but um, it makes a lot of sense if they play well, especially that you know the Hawks might look to get some future value for those guys, especially. Bellinelli and Elias because those are actually on um, pure one-year contracts, and they're a little bit on the older side, whereas Deadman, um, there's a little bit more upside there. So I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think if Travis Schlenk, you know, everything that he said on the record and 
I, I think it's pretty clear that they probably understand this is a rebuilding year. So if they want to look in the future, in the future, at least to some degree, it might make some sense to move on from those guys. But listen, I mean, Bud is Bud is very good at his job. So if, if his team overachieves versus versus its roster, it will not surprise anyone like you and I that will watch this team closely because he's uh, very capable of doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like the pieces are what the pieces are, and their level of talent isn't that great, but they kind of fit together. They do. The five-out offense fits Bud. It kind of fits Dennis. You know, they signed big men that can shoot in the off season. It just kind of all goes together. And now, you know, Bud keeps talking about, you know, not just pace and space, but like uber pace to go with space. He wants to play really, really fast. And, you know, I know that's cliche for just about everybody's preseason, but when he kind of stops and says, no, 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 but really fast, you know, he kind of means it. Yeah, I think he, it's something that he's definitely said all the time since he came to Atlanta. So it's uh, my guard is up a little bit on that. But yeah, I would definitely agree. Everything, everything that everything that I've heard from Bud as and really seen on the court, I think we've seen some changes that sort of lean in that direction. And there and there really isn't that guy that can, you know, la- last year they had Dwight Howard who was never going to be the the uber pace guy uh, <laughs> for you know all everything everything about Dwight we can kind of leave off, off the table for this podcast, but. At, at, at the very least, he was never going to be someone that was going to be, you know, get it going end to end in the way that he used to be able to when he was younger. And this year, you know, Deadman's not this like super duper athlete, but he's much more of a fluid, uh, you know, end to end kind of guy. And the other the other bigs are pretty mobile, so there's no, there's nothing really holding them back. And then you have the the blur of a point guard with Dennis Schroeder too, which really helps. So I, I believe, Bud, we'll see how much we'll see how, just just how fast they can actually play. I think he definitely wants to play fast. All right. So uh, the Milwaukee Bucks, forty-six and a half wins. Ooh, that's uh, a team very close to your heart, I know. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go under a little, um, with the full statement that you know this team could certainly come together in one fifty, and it wouldn't surprise me. Giannis is a freak in the best possible way, um, but. I think, you know, that'd be a pretty decent leap for them from last year. Um, And that's those always kind of scare me when especially teams that run back the same roster because they really didn't do anything in the offseason, which they didn't you know, they didn't necessarily need to do anything. Right. Um, But at the same time, teams that don't do much with their roster and then are projected to win, you know, that'd be four and a half more wins. They won 42 last year. I know they do get. I know they have some health stuff with you know with Jabari Middleton playing more games potentially, especially Middleton playing more games and Jabari potentially uh, being back pretty soon. It's uh, you're asking a lot of guys who had career years last year. You know, even if you take Giannis off the table, which I think we kind of can. Tony Snell was really good last year. I'm not sure you can buy that necessarily. Malcolm Brogdon was awesome, and I love him, but will he be as good as he was last year, et cetera? So. Greg Monroe is another guy, too, who was very good, sort of sneakily under the radar. So I'll, I'll go under a little, but I could look foolish in a hurry, if uh, especially if Jabari is suddenly healthy and Middleton's a full season and they look really good because this is a team that – it's the rare team in the East that has a ton of upside for this year. They're kind of the only one in that non-top four group that really has that kind of upside. Wait, who's in the top four group? Well, the, like the standard top four. Like I'm not necessarily, not necessarily for this year, but the oh, okay. Cleveland, Cle- Cleveland, Boston, Toronto, Washington is kind okay. of the – Last year's top four, and I think you know all those teams. I'm not a huge believer in Toronto and what they decided to do, but I think those two, those four teams are pretty safe to be. Maybe not necessarily the top four, but at least those four teams are, are going to be in the top six, and it would be a shock if they weren't that kind of thing. Gotcha. Whereas Milwaukee, I think is pretty much right there as well, but there's a little bit more volatility based on the fact they just they just haven't done it. You know, we, they won 42 games last year that we haven't seen them win 50. With this group, whereas those other four teams, we kind of we kind of already seen it. We haven't seen him win fifty since like Glenn Robinson. Yeah, I mean, and, and they're gonna do. I mean, it's gonna happen <laughs> soon. I think I'm just not sure it's, it's gonna be this soon with some of the uncertainty that they still have. I mean, if, if Jabari was healthy right now and not coming off an injury, and so was Middleton, I would totally go over. I think, but there's just, there's enough of that weirdness there where you just don't you just don't know. Okay. The uh, the Denver Nuggets forty three and a half. I'm going over. Uh, I will not go under on every single one. This will be the I, this might be the only one I go over on, but I, I will go over. Um, I, I love Paul Millsap uh, unconditionally. I will I'll, I will say that the biggest the biggest thing with Denver last year is that they were really bad on defense, and 
Paul Millsap's going to help them on defense. Uh, he won't make them great on defense because they have a lot of guys who are not going to be individually good. But, you know, I've long said, and, and you know, I've talked about this on and off the air, different places that, you know, Paul is still somehow underrated as a defender. He's one of the 10 best defensive players in the league. Having that guy around really helps. And offensively, he's not going to hurt them. I mean, he might not be this huge upgrade for them offensively from Danilo Gallinari, who's a good offensive player. But uh, I think Paul and some per, some uh, some growth from their young guys. You know, Jokic is still super young, Jamal Murray, et cetera, et cetera. So, I uh, without going too deep into them, I guess uh, I'll go over. I would say probably slightly because the West is sort of a juggernaut, but I think I'd have them somewhere in the forty-five win range, which is uh, you know slightly over. All right, you're not nervous at all about point guard situation. Oh, I'm definitely nervous. Uh, <laughs> The only reason why it's not as big of a deal as it should be is that they run so much offense through Jokic. Um, If there was a team, if this was another team that didn't have that kind of facilitating guy, like, you know, when they were, they were famously the the best offense in the league last year and the second half, even better than Golden State is because they basically ran everything through Jokic. Um, I I don't like that they don't have a good point guard on the roster. Uh, Jamal Murray, I like as a player, but I don't think he's a point guard and he kind of wasn't good last year um there's some I, I understand what people what people see in him and i kind of like him as a prospect but i think people sort of penciling him in as a as an average starter even as a point guard for this year are kind of uh a little bit crazy but they do <laughs> they do have they do have jameer nelson to be like the safe guy and moody is you know not good necessarily either but i think they could probably cobble together enough at point guard where it won't kill them that's kind of all they need to do for me in the end, though, I do think Murray is not is not a point guard, and we're going to kind of see that. Hopefully, I'm wrong about that because if he's good, they're going to be even better than I think they will be. Right. Um, I just don't really see see him as like that, you know, full time point guard with his especially especially defensively and the fact that he's not really a pure facilitator. He, he's a, he's a decent passer, but I think defensively is where they're going to have some problems there, where he's trying to stand in front of point guards. And they don't, I, I know that I don't, they they can use Gary Harris in that role too, which does help them uh, to, to guard some some of the better guys at point guard, but. There's enough cross-match stuff there where it'd be a little bit worrisome for me. All right. From Paul Millsap's team to Jeff Teague's team, how about the Minnesota Timberwolves? Ooh. Uh, 46 and a half. Sorry. I meant to give you the number. 46 and a half. <laughs> no. Uh, it's, they're so weird, man. I, I know <laughs> it's it's the weirdest thing because, you know, last year, normally like my – I think you could probably tell, but people listening could probably tell how I feel about this kind of stuff by how I'm talking so far – Minnesota won was it 31 games yeah 31 games last year and I know they're different but you don't normally see teams jump it would be 17 no 16 17 wins to get over this over um I know Jimmy Butler is a lot of wins by himself because he's really really good at basketball and they didn't have to trade much of anything to get him um but still you like if you look at their defense from last year it was really really bad Butler will help that but how much will he help that uh, Teague as well, you know, Teague to Rubio, they're very different players. Um, I'm not sure Jeff is that much better than Ricky Rubio. It's just he's a better fit than R- R- the Rubio would have been because they just need the somewhat shooting uh, on, on the perimeter. They need they need Teague who is not this knock knockdown guy, but he can shoot. Uh, ooh. I'm gonna say <laughs> it's like right around the number. I think I really think they're gonna win like somewhere in the mid to high 40s. So like 46, 46 and a half is right there. So. Uh, I'll just say under out of principle, just because I think if anything goes wrong, if they just somehow don't defend uh, again, then it'll be under. And I think sneak, I mean, maybe you don't agree with me on this, but I think people don't understand how bad um, Towns and Wiggins have both been defensively. (laughs) Uh, I really, really, I mean, I love Towns. Everybody loves Towns. He's going to be awesome. He already is really good, but he's not good on defense. Like he might be, and Wiggins I still can't figure out why he's not good on defense. Uh, it was he was this great defensive prospect with all these tools, and he's not ever been that. And so, right now, I think the best defensive player in their starting five is Jimmy Butler, which is weird because he's also the best offensive player. Maybe I mean it's either him or Towns. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. It's 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 tough for me. All the talent is there. This is a 51 roster. I just don't know if they fit all together yet. So. I'll go slightly under uh, and be prepared to look silly if it all clicks. All right. And uh, last but not least, Oklahoma City. 52 and a half. Ooh. Um, 
I'm going to say over uh, somewhat begrudgingly only because um, I'm not sure how it's all going to work. I do like it a lot. You know, I think last year, I think what's going to fool people is that last year they won 47 um, with the Russell Westbrook show, but their point differential was like a 40 <laughs> win point differential. Right. So I'm not really sure what the baseline is. If you're going off a 40, if you're going off, off of a 47 win baseline and you go out and get Paul George and Carmelo Anthony for, you know, the returns that they gave up, uh, it makes all the sense in the world to go over. I'm just not sure they actually were a 47 win team last year. So that's the worry spot for me. But I, I, you know, the sneaky move that I love with Oklahoma city is Patrick Patterson mm-hmm. being there and kind of being that combo. Like he's the backup, he's the backup center and the backup power forward. I just like him a lot. They got him on a huge discount and that'll help them a lot. They're going to need Russ to be not necessarily as good as it was last year, but they, they, they can't really afford a huge drop off from Russ to get to get to the over. But I think Russ has another year or two of this, of this level in him. So I'll go over. Um, I think Mello is going to be good there, which is probably what I'm banking on a little bit. I think Mello you know, is not going to be pure Olympic mellow, but I think he'll he at least sort of understands that he's not the guy there, which will, I think, bring out the best in him. So, you know, somewhere in the low to mid 50s. So it's not like they're going to win 60 games, but I think uh, slightly is over for me. OK, so for the record, you've got uh, Denver and Oklahoma City as your overs and then Minnesota, Atlanta and Milwaukee as your unders. Did I get that right? Yeah, and I think. It's kind of funny. I think you picked five that are all pretty good numbers. Like I have, or there's a couple of teams where I would have like had stronger opinions. But you know, <laughs> it, it should it should be it should be stated that like Vegas is pretty good at this. So <laughs> like you only get to find a couple a year where I'm where people really kind of jump on one side in a in a strong way. For the most part, they're getting better at it, which is kind of scary and. Um, it's tough. I mean, they're very intriguing, which is why I know what I know why you picked those teams because they're all very interesting. But uh, yeah, that's my picks are on the record, so I can't hide from them now. <laughs> all right. Well, very good. Now we get into the fun stuff. You got your basketball reference ready? Yeah, I'm gonna. We'll we'll do what we can over here. It's gonna be interesting. I'm I'm ready. Let's do all it. All right. First one, Kyrie Irving over or under twenty six and a half points a game. Ooh, Lord, that's a lot of points. Um, my 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 gut reaction is under. I'm pulling up his page just to make sure I'm not crazy. Uh, <laughs> ooh, that's actually okay. And it's not as crazy as I thought. He you know he averaged 25.2 a game last year. Shot the ball incredibly well. It was the best shooting of his career. I'm not sure he's gonna be able to do that again. Um, I will say under because I just think projecting someone's career high by more than a point is always a little bit risky in your seventh season. But, you know, without LeBron, he's going to have the ball in his hands a lot. I, I do mm-hmm. think Gordon Hayward is going to have the ball in his hands a lot too, but Boston's offense is going to be more free flowing than Cleveland's was, which might actually take away from him weirdly. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll go under slightly. I mean, but he could average 28 and it wouldn't blow me away at all. Just because especially preseason stuff, he's not been shy about getting shots up. That's never been Kyrie's thing. He's never been uh one to one, run away from a shot, but I think uh, I'll, I'll go. I'll go under, even if uh, I'm not terribly sold. All right. Next one, rookie John Collins. Yes, seventy-two blocks. Ooh, I'll make you do your uh, math here. I'm going to do some of their like totals as opposed to game oh, game cool. averages. Um, I'll go over on that. I think. For what we see in the preseason, he's going to play. I was I was a little worried before the preseason that he was going to get buried early on, but there's been no indication of that. Uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I think it seems like he's going to be in a rotation opening night, which is very encouraging. Um, and if he is, I think he can probably block a shot a game. Um, I don't think he's going to be this great this great rim protector, especially right away. But you know, if you're if you're playing if you're playing 22 minutes a game and you're John Collins, I think, I think he can probably average a block, a block a game. That's a, that's a good number though. I'm not super sold on it. It's just, I think if we're assuming health or relative health, which means, I mean, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70, 75 games, I think he can get there. Um, only because I think he's one thing about rookies too, is that I think he'll go for blocks. We've seen that in the preseason uh, is that he's not going to be shy about fouling. And I think he's going to be aggressive, which is they'll probably have to legislate that out of, out of him a little bit and that he's <laughs> going to have to start staying on the court a little bit more as it gets older. But I think in his rookie year, he'll be he'll be foul prone, but that also means he'll be aggressive and get a lot of blocks. 
Yeah, I asked him about staying out of foul trouble, and he said it wasn't really a, something that they had talked about or been concerned about yet. But I, you can they, definitely they kind to, of see that, right? They, they need to talk about it because, uh, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, he's only the second the, the second biggest foul thing because uh, Dwayne Dedman cannot stay on the floor. So, uh, at least in his past. It was better last year in San Antonio, but Collins is – Everything we've seen in the preseason is that I don't I don't I don't think he's going to have a whole lot of uh, experience in terms of avoiding fouls. I think he's going to have a very high foul rate, which is fine when you're not a full time starter. Like if he's playing 20 minutes a game, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's just whether you're w- down the line when he's right. suddenly playing in the 30s and you're worried about his fouls is when it gets to be a problem. But for now, be aggressive, John. Go block some shots. <laughs> we'll come back to John later because I asked Coach Bud about playing younger players today, and I you know kind of an interesting response. But moving on with these over unders here. Joel Embiid, 600 total rebounds. Ooh, I'm going to need to see how many he had last year. I'm doing the math in my head now. Uh, by the way, he looked very good this evening. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I wrote that number before uh, before tonight. No, 600 rebounds. That means, oh, it's so tough. Um, I am going to say, okay, so Embiid averaged – 7.8 last year, but he only played 25 minutes a game. I'm going to say under. Um, and that could be really dumb because if, if he plays 70 games, he's going to obliterate that number. Um, but I think Philadelphia is going to treat him with kid gloves like, like they did last year. He'll probably play a little bit more on a per game basis, and he's going to rebound great when he plays. But I think he needs to get to 55 games to go over that number. And I'm not sure he'll get that. I mean, we, we've obviously not, we've never seen him do it. He's played 31 games in three years. Uh, I'm rooting for him to be healthy. We all want him to be healthy, but I think the smarter money is on the under only because I think, again, he, I think he needs to get to at least 50. Um, I don't think he's going to average more than 12 rebounds a game, uh, even if he plays a lot. So, yeah, I'll, I'll go under, even though I'm, I'm rooting for that. I'm rooting to be wrong on this one. I'd love to have him play 70 games and just be his awesome self. Okay. Here's one that I really don't have a feel for, and it's it's a real basic one. It's Tabo Cephalosha, 1,200 minutes. Oh, my goodness. Um, ooh. <laughs> I mean, it's a very... What's, what's his role going to be? I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, they have a ton of guys, and that's sort of the Utah moniker under this current system. I mean, they, they, they seem to always have like 12, 13 real guys, and he's one of them. Um, I mean, what do you have to average to get 12, 1,200 minutes? You you figure he won't play every. He'll probably only play seventy games. Uh, I'm gonna say under, only because I just, as you said, I, I don't really know what his role is, and he's an older guy. I can't imagine even if he's in the rotation on a nightly basis, which I kind of assume he will be. He's not going to be a more than a seventeen or eighteen minute again guy, right? I can't see that happening. I just can't. I mean, unless there's an injury ahead of him, I think at, when they're at full strength, I can't see him getting 20 minutes a game, um, which he doesn't need to to get to get over this number. But you, you need durability and playing time. I'll say under a little bit. I think that's a good number, though, with all the uncertainty sort of baked in because, you know, Tabo's a guy I love and always have enjoyed, but they need offense on that team. So I think <laughs> there'll be, there'll be nights where he just can't play a lot because the other guys in their team who are better players at this point than Tabo are defense first for the most part, aside from Rodney hood, they really don't have any offense first guys on the entire roster. So if they need to go offense off the bench at times, it's going to not be with Tabo. Uh, you might see more Joe Johnson, et cetera. So I'll go under, although if he stays healthy all season, I probably won't be right. Okay. Uh, you're, good, you're good at this, by the way. Oh, are- I, I've got one like two from now, and you're going to be like, when I get to that one, you'll be like, no, that's a ridiculous number. And I think <laughs> I think it's because I'm just strangely optimistic about that one. But before we do that one, Chris Paul, CP3, 625 assists. I love Chris Paul unconditionally. I will say that. Uh, he's my favorite point guard of all time. Wow. Yeah, I mean, of guys that I've of guys that I watched. A lot. So, my, my my just as a little bit, little, little bit of story about me. I, I was born in LA, and my dad was a Lakers fan um, when I was born. So, I take Magic off the table because I just grew up hearing about Magic all the time. Um, <laughs> but aside from that, yeah, I love Chris Paul. It's my guy. So, 
But yeah, the the really the big question is how much he's going to have the ball in his hands. You know, last year he only had 563 assists, and a lot of that is that he only played 61 games. But you know, he's usually good for an injury at some point, um, and he won't have the ball in his hands nearly as much. So I'm going to say under. I think Paul will probably play 70 games and average somewhere in the eight and a half assist per game range, which seems so low. I mean. I, I'm right. pretty confident he's never averaged that little. Yeah, he's never averaged that little since his rookie year, but he's never had the ball in his hands as little as, as he's going to this year. I, I assume that they're going to stagger at some point and have him play without Harden. Uh, sure. I would hope that they play all 48 minutes with one of those guys on the court. That makes a lot of sense, right? To me, um, and he'll have the massive assist numbers when he, when Harden's not playing. But when Harden is playing, I just don't see Paul racking up the kind of assist rate that you have to have to get to where he needs to get to. If he plays, I mean, if you if you play 70, 77 games, though, he's going to get over it. I think it's just he's had a you know as he gets older here, he's only played more than seventy four games once in the last six years. So I think it's pretty safe to assume he's going to play seventy or less. And if you Which do that, be smart, so. yeah, yeah, that would be very smart for them to to save oh, him a little bit for the playoffs. Because yeah. you've got a, a player who kind of hits the wall in the playoffs, and a team that seems to have hit the wall in the playoffs a couple times. Uh, might be good to to do some strategery and rest yeah, they some don't guys need to push up. Him. I mean, they don't need to push him at all, and I, and I think they'd be insane to let Harden play all eighty two again. Like, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know that was the thing that he like sort of wanted to do last year. Him and Russ both were like fighting to see who would take a day off first, and they kind of never did it. Um, but I, <laughs> I would hope that they don't do that again because I mean, even if you don't think that was why Harden sort of disappeared in the playoffs at that at the very end. Uh, it can't be great. To, I mean, some of it probably is workload, and that'll be less than this year with Paul around, which is probably helpful. But, uh, I mean, I think we've kind of seen that guys playing 82 as primary options that just carry that, like, you know, the 35% usage rates kind of kind of uh, high bar to clear. All right. Here's the one where I'm really optimistic. Torian Prince, 130 steals. 130? 130. That's a big number. That's like 1.6 a game. Yeah, something like that. I, I have to go under just out of, <laughs> out of principle. But I will say, if you look at the – I'm not sure who did these projections on uh, basketball reference, but whoever does, does their projections projects him for 1.5 per 36 minutes, which still wouldn't get him there because he's not, he's not going to play 30, 36 minutes a game. But it's a fairly high number of steals. He has, he has great hands. He's going to be aggressive. Uh, his steal rate last year was very good. Like, not super elite, but um, solidly above average. So I don't think you're that crazy. I, I think he would probably – if it was 100, if your number was 100, I think I'd probably go over. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, you're you're a little high. I mean, I think <laughs> you knew that. You knew that, though. I knew that. I knew that was the one that I, I think I, I skewed it. I mean, it w- listen, it's not impossible. I will say that. It would not, like, <laughs> blow me away if Torian averaged, you know, one point seven steals a game but the problem is even if even for him to get even if you assume he's playing 80 games which right. is always a bold assumption it's, i don't i still don't think he gets there which is tough yeah i mean i do think he's gonna play a lot of games i think he's gonna he play is. a lot of minutes just because i know bud doesn't differentiate but when it comes to defensive assignments it feels like the hawks have a lot of two guards and not that many threes Oh yeah, that's something I've been talking about a lot. I mean, I think even with you offline is that he's really the only three on the roster. I think. I mean, <laughs> Nick Nick Brasino is a three, right? But not he's you know defensively, not, he's, he's not going to be in the rotation, right? I mean, other than that, every other guy they have, you know, Luke Babbitt's a four at this point. Uh, Baysmore is a two. Bellinelli's a two. Uh, Bembry is the closest thing to a three, I think, other than Prince. But he's and he could be a three defensively. Yeah, he's but he's still really thin. I mean, there's certain matchups where Torian's the only guy on the team you want guarding certain guys. Right. Um. So yeah, I, I'm I'm with you 100. I think if he, I think he's probably going to finish. Would it surprise you if he finished if he led the team in minutes this year? Oh, not at all. Me neither. Not, I think it's. That, I think that's almost a, almost a lock. Like it, I guess Schroeder would be the one Schreuder. guy. Yeah, I it's think those, those would be two. the two guys for me. Is that. It's kind of how much Bud wants to ride a young guy because I mean, Bays has never played that kind of minute, that that kind of workload. Even though you think you know he's the established vet starter on the wing, I'd be pretty surprised if Torrey didn't play more than Bays more though. I so, 
Yeah, uh, you know, minutes aren't going to be a problem. I, I do think, though, he, he has to have a pretty obscene skill rate. <laughs> that number. But uh, okay. he's good. Listen, he's going to play a lot, and I'm, I'm all in on Torian. So I hope, I, I hope it goes over because that means he's uh, been super aggressive and using all of his immense physical traits defensively to uh, sort of their highest level. So that'd be good. All right, here's one. This is this is kind of a weird one. In fact, the last two are both kind of weird because we're kind of I love weird kind of jostling the numbers to to come up with a decent question to ask. But it's for LeBron, and the number is seventeen, and the stat is assists and rebounds combined seventeen. Um. Okay, let's look at this here because <laughs> I don't want to guess. Okay, so last year it was seventeen point three. Was but... it okay? Yeah, but before that, he had never gotten to 17. Right. And that was the first year in his career he did that. Um, so my math brain tells me to go under because just all the data says under. Um, with that said, it's kind of how he decides to play. Because if LeBron decides he wants to try to average a triple double, I think he could do that. Um, the question. I'll still go under. I just don't think he's gonna want. If he wants it, he'll get it. If he doesn't, he it, and he won't. That's kind of that's kind of a short version of LeBron. <laughs> but if you look at his career of you know fourteen seasons, he's only he's only done it once. So I have I have to go under and be safe. But you know, when last season is the one time he went over, it's not. It's crazy. I sort of feel like he's gonna get like ten rebounds a game this year. Like I don't. I think they're going to use Thompson less. They're going to have Love at center where it's going to be him yep. harder for him to rebound. They're going to do some things where, you know, he doesn't want to guard a, a quick three and they'll, maybe they'll try Jay Crowder on him and, and put him on the four or something like that. I just think he's going to have more chances and more incentive to, to get rebounds. I just don't know about the assists. Like, do you have to put the ball in Derrick Rose's hands because you really can't play him off the ball? Is he in the rotation when Thomas is hurt? I mean, I lost so many weird questions about that team yeah rose is an interesting thought experiment and the point about thomas is a good one in that i think lebron will average more assists when uh, when thomas is back but we don't know when thomas is going to be back because thomas is super comfortable off the ball we saw that last year in boston he's he's cool with that um the rebounding thing is a good point though that i hadn't really thought about is that i don't think he's going to play any small forward this year, like right. I, I'm pretty surprised. I mean, barring injury to Crowder or something, I don't think LeBron's going to really play any small four all year. He's, he'll be playing alongside Thompson or Love, but not really both of those guys very much. Maybe occasionally they'll do that, but um, we've not. I mean, when when you're coming out of the gate and starting lineup and basically saying that you know Tristan's coming off the bench, uh, I think I you know I'm not I'm not sure you sold me enough to go over 17, but. I, if he averaged not, you know, if, if, let's, let's just say he averages nine and a half rebounds a game, which would be a career high. He only then has to get to seven and a half assists, which has been a number that he's gotten over a bunch of times. So, yeah, I mean, it's just it's all about how he wants to play. If he wants to play that, not necessarily passive, but if if, if he wants to go out and score thirty a game, then he's not gonna, then he's not going to get these numbers. Right. But if he wants to do the I'm going to do everything thing, like, which is what he did last year all year, he basically just did everything he wanted to do. And sort of not coasted, but he was very efficient. It was uh, sort of dialed down a little bit. I think that's uh, very reasonable, and I like your rebounding point a lot. Okay. Last one, and maybe you don't think Golden State is going to have the best record this year, and and if so, it's it's easy to uh, I do to pick so that out here. But comparing Golden State to the team with the second best record. Six and a half wins better than the second best team. Uh, ooh, that's a good. That's, that's about what Vegas is, is. I would say. Is it? Yeah, uh, really look at that. <laughs> well, it's. I think the only other team. No, I, I. I know for a fact the only. I don't. I don't think anybody else in the league has more than sixty-one projection. I don't think I'm looking that up now to make sure I don't look silly, but I right. think I'm right about no, that. No, I think that's right. Um, and I'm kind of so, of the opinion that I don't know, 67 is just so many. I mean, I know they're loaded, and I know they're going to get some duds, but here's yeah. I mean, my thing, I'm going to say over, but only because I'm not convinced that they're going to win, you know, 70 right. or something like that. I mean, they they certainly, if they care to do that and don't have injuries, I think they could. I just don't think they're going to care as much. Um, the argument against that is that it may it, they may not have to care to get it. 
Um, they're not gonna they're not gonna be going for seventy four, but I think they can sort of almost go pedal off and still win sixty nine games because they're that stupidly good. Um, <laughs> but no, I think I'm I'm gonna go over only because I don't see the team out there that's really capable of putting up the sixty three. You know what I mean? Like right. maybe Houston could do that. Um, but they're pretty much the only other team in the league I could see that really could go like into the 60s. Uh, with apologies to Greg Popovich and company in San Antonio, I think they're very safe to win 50 plus, but I don't really see them winning 60 again. I just don't see the talent level there. I mean, they they were great last year. I, mean, I think they're actually worse than they were last year. And even then, like we were kind of all baffled as to how they won 61 games last year because <laughs> the roster, I mean, all credit to Pop and Kawhi, Amazing. but that roster is not a 61 roster. Um, so I just don't see the other t- – I mean, maybe somebody gets to 59, 60, and that's, maybe, that's, maybe that's all they have to do to cover this number. But if we assume that 67 and a half, which is the Warriors over-under number, is a good one, um, I think if they get to 66 or 67, they're going to get over this because I'm, I'm not sure that anybody else is even going to touch 60. So I'll go over. And just some of the parity in the West is probably good too. And that uh, parity is p- p- probably the wrong word, but some of the strength of the West at the top is that it's kind of scary and that they, they might knock off a couple wins from each other. So I'll say over. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I think, you know, Golden State will probably end up with something like 65. And I think there are going to be a ton of 50 plus win teams, but. I don't think anybody else is going to get that close to 60. Yeah, that's that's my whole thing. I just don't see – I think Houston's – maybe Oklahoma City. Maybe Oklahoma City. If, like, <laughs> everything went perfectly, they could get to 60. Right. I don't see that happening. No. But, like, those are the two teams that had the ups. I don't think anybody in the East has the ability to get to 60 wins. I just – I don't see it. I mean, Cleveland, Cleveland if – I guess if Cleveland had Isaiah all year and was trying – but that's two big leaps to make. Um, <laughs> Boston has too many moving parts and new pieces, and that's kind of it in the East. So yeah, I, um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Golden State's the only team that gets to 60, and they do it comfortably enough for they win seven more games. Than everybody else. All right, sounds good. All right, so you know that I write for Hawks.com, and you know that puts me in some situations where you know I've <laughs> got to tread carefully. Absolutely. So today I was trying to ask Bud a question, you know, an interesting sort of challenging question that wasn't too much of a softball because I wanted to know whether or not there's mandate is probably too strong a word, but a push to play some of the younger players to kind of get a jump start on the youth movement. And, you know, of course, halfway through asking the question, I started to get Bud face. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, I want to hear what you think about it. And if, you know, if you think this is a, a good answer or a politically correct answer, you know, I, I want to know what you think about what Bud says here. When, when Travis met the media bef- you know, before camp started, he said he had two objectives, and one of them was to make the roster a lot younger. Does that make your job different in terms of playing youth, or does it just mean that you go about picking who plays the same way? It's just that there are younger pieces to pick from. Yeah, no, I think guys have to earn their minutes. Guys have to, um, you know, do it in practice, do it in, you know, just their day-to-day work. And, um, you know, I think just obviously naturally we're younger. And But I, I do think there will be younger guys on the court, but the guys that, you know, John Collins is earning his minutes. Um, you know, so it's, it's going to be important for John to understand that that's what he's got to do. And, um, you know, as he grows and progresses in this league, nobody's going to give him anything. And so if he's going to... You know, take steps forward. He's going to have to earn it and work for it, and you know, it's the same for minutes. Okay, Brad, what do you think about what he said there? You know, I'm I'm not overly surprised. Uh, it's a very bud answer. Uh, hearing <laughs> hear, hearing you say that uh, he gave you bud face is kind of a funny because we've all we've all got that before. So, um, I, I don't think he was ever going to say that there's any sort of mandate or anything like that to, to play young guys. I do think though. As I think we talked about earlier, at least I did for a brief second. Um, I was a, not surprised, but I was a little worried that Collins wouldn't play, for instance. He's really the right. only guy that's like a pure youth movement piece. But Bud really might think, and honestly, he might not be wrong. I think Bud might think that Collins is someone they need this year because he's really the only player that is the kind of player that he is on this roster. 
Um, you know, Deadman is obviously going to be better defensively right away and right. is the better rebound shot blocker. But um, Collins is sort of the only explosive front court, you know, real threat like that in the on, on the offensive end. So maybe he thinks that, that he's actually should be in a rotation. And he's really the only guy that you look at that's a, that would be the prime target for the front office to say, hey, man, we're, we want you to play Collins. Um, and I, but I would never say, I mean, even if you what about got with like, that mandate, What about like Bembry versus, say, Bellinelli or something like that? Yeah, that's it's interesting. I, I do think that we don't know yet about what Bud's going to do with that. That's a good specific one just because they're the third and fourth wings in my mind, which means they both can play, um, which kind of gives them a little bit of cover. I think Bell and they, they're just so different that Bud can just kind of say, I'm going matchups. You know, Bellinelli's the shooter. Um, Bembry's the better defensive player and the more, you know, facilitation kind of guy. So I think they're both going to be in rotation most nights. You know, Bud does not like to push minutes, as you well know. So the great right. majority of the time, he's going to play four wings in a game. And he really has those four wings. He's got Bazemore, Prince, Bembry, and uh, Bellinelli. And I think, you know, they'll both, they'll just play them. But it, it's, it's, it's very interesting to monitor. I, I, it's sort of the same thing, though, that there's a reasonable argument to be made that Bembry, if he is playing well, is as good as Bellinelli right now. It's like you have to play the this, this like wildly inferior option, if, if that makes sense. Like they don't. If, if if Bud starts playing Tyler Dorsey, then I will. You know, my eyebrow will be raised on <laughs> on what, whether what, whether he's been told to do that because you know right. I think there's not really an argument to say Tyler Dorsey is better than any of these guys we're talking about. Sure. But with Bembry and Collins, like you know those guys are capable i mean collins the jury is out obviously he's a rookie but from what we see in the preseason i don't think he's going to be out there embarrassing himself so um yeah i mean it, it would not surprise me at, at some point if bud and travis schlank or whoever in the front office had that discussion you know maybe down the line but i think early in the year especially bud's going to play the guys that he wants to play and if if some if somehow you know one of the guys that the front office wants to play is not playing maybe that maybe that, that, maybe that becomes a discussion later on right if you see Miles Plumley ahead of John Collins a lot. That's not, not going to happen. I don't think so either. So I asked actually. Well, speaking of asking Bud questions, I asked um, I asked him if Plumley was going to be starting to shoot threes because you know Collins is shooting threes, Deadman is shooting Deadman, threes, and yeah. I was like, they're they're transforming all these guys into shooters, and he pretty much laughed me off. He's like, no, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's like, well, you know, I guess that's a reasonable question. I respect that question, but no. <laughs> well, I do think like he's Plumlee's the only guy on the roster to where Bud would have to like change the five out. Like he's not a five out player. Right. Uh, Deadman, I mean, we've seen him shoot threes now, but even if you take that off the table, which I think is still, I'm not sure he's going to be doing that in the regular season. We'll see. Um, but at least he is rangy enough to where Bud doesn't have, like, he, he can, he can, he can just be the dive man and pick and roll and he's right. not going to kill your spacing. Right. Um, whereas Plumley is much more of a plotter. So I think, you know, that's one reason why we may not see Plumley a lot. And of course he's just maybe not as good as the other guys anyway. Right. Um, but he, it's kind of weird than that. He's really the only player on the 15 man projected roster that is, doesn't really fit. If that makes sense. Like everybody else has a role that you can see in this offense and defensively, there'll be some questions, but you know, Luke Babbitt, you think about Luke Babbitt, like that's like a, I mean, he's a, he's a pure stretch for like, sure. Space, floor spacer and he may not play a ton but if he does play you know what he's going to do whereas Plumley, in this offense it's it'd be it would look a lot more like the white like the white howard did last year they're very different players i know i understand that let me say that out loud i'm not comparing those two guys as players but um howard never felt like he fit perfectly in what but wanted to do offensively and Plumley would be the same way and that it's not anything that he's doing wrong it's just not his his strengths are not um suited to that kind of you know, pace especially, but uh, five, the five out ball movement, spacing nature that they want to run offensively. So, aside from that, without go, without going too deep on Miles Plumley, um, I do. Oh, I just, we already did. It's too late. It, 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 <laughs> yeah, it is. But he's that. That's like the one time you need to worry if you're a Hawks fan that Bud is um, going too deep into the veterans, as if he's suddenly not playing John Collins and Miles Plumley's playing. That, that that that's worrisome. But other than that, I think we're. I think. He, it's a very Bud answer is the way I would put that. I think Bud's not going to give away too much. And at the same time, um, even if he was told to play the young guys, he's, he wouldn't he wouldn't tell you that. All right, Brad, thank you. Got anything you want to plug? 
Sure. I mean, other than this fine podcast, which I am a frequent listener again, I, I would encourage people to listen to this show. But uh, I also host my own Hawks podcast. Uh, I, I almost said daily. It's it's mostly daily um, right now. We'll get we'll get to daily eventually pretty soon here. As Is it week daily? Happens. Week daily, I should say. Yeah, not not seven days a week, but it's it's called the Locked On Hawks podcast. If you like the Hawks. Check that out. And uh, I'm also the – I don't even know what the word is. I, I run PeachtreeHoops.com over at Espination. So if you like the Hawks, about reading the Hawks, if you want to read people other than Kale, because you definitely should read Kale, uh, you can also read uh, over at PeachtreeHoops.com, and I'm always in the building. So you and, I, you and I were around each other a lot starting basically now. So we'll, we'll have time to talk offline. But if anybody has any questions, also uh, at BT Roll on Twitter if you want to follow me there. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you for having me, sir. Have a good one. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, Just go to cars.com. It's magical.